Hello, everybody. Are we excited for our next guest that we see seated next to me? I want to hear more. I need more, guys. There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sci-Fi's Lot. Uh, live streaming, we have with us today and a wonderful, wonderful guest. He is a actor, comedian, voice actor, producer. You're a multi-hyphenate, my friend. <laughs> I'm all the hyphens. And it is, of course, Mr. Phil Lamar. Hello, sir. Hi, Tara. How are you? I am very good. And just to, to let you guys know who I am, I am Tara Bennett. I am a senior producer and editor for Sci-Fi Wire. And she got a couple hyphens herself. I'm a, a little, a little mini hyphens, but <laughs> I am first and foremost a huge fan of your work, um, especially oh, Mr. Samurai Jack. Hello. Thank you very much for your support. Oh, all right, I'm done. This is the greatest <laughs> day ever. No, uh, you know, I wanted to ask because you were able to finished the story for Jack last Finally. year. Finally. Well, and it was 14 years of fans basically going, well, we're probably really never going to get an end to that story. <laughs> well, it was 14 years of me running into Gendy every place. It's like, what do you think? It's like, I really want to finish the story. And... Finally, all of the elements, you know, the, the planets aligned in just the right way, and he was able to do it, and I think he just knocked it out of the park on a creative level. It's just so... It, it took everything that was great about the original run of the series and just amped it up even more. I want to go back to... You. So you had those conversations for years. Yeah. When did you finally, how did it come across? And it, it, was it a call? Was it, you know, somebody finally coming from Cartoon Network saying uh, to your agent, what was the well, process? No. <laughs> well, the process was I saw something on the internet saying, Samurai Jack is coming back. Of course, that's always a way, I was right? like, <laughs> really? And I called my agent. And they're like, we haven't heard anything. Like, oh. And of course, this was right after they had re started, announced the reboot of Powerpuff Girls right. with none of the original of the Powerpuff right. Girls. So we were a little nervous. A little nervous, yeah. Um, no, I had to um, find Gendy's wife on Facebook because he's not on any social media. <laughs> and like, hey, I heard this Samurai Jack's coming back. That's cool, right? You, you want some people that were there before, would right? I, would, do I? She's like, yeah, here, call Gendy. It's fine. <laughs> He said, of course, of course, yes, no. I'm doing it, and you're doing it. I'm like, all right, good. That's all I need to know. Awesome. So what was the process? Uh, you know, sometimes creators like to do a little walkthrough with people so they can see the art. Sometimes they just get scripts. What was the process for you? Well, I think there wasn't time. Mm -hmm. Because part of the, you know, alignment of things was that Gendy had a break in his schedule between right. Hotel Transylvania movies and he and Brian Andrews and, you know, all the rest of the creative people just, you know, hit the ground running. Like, let's write this, let's get this going, let's, you know, because I think they had the idea, but then they had to flesh it out, yeah. get it, you know, complete, and then get it moving. And, you know, it's not easy to do, well, one, it's not easy to do animation, period. No. And it's really difficult to do animation at that level. Right, exactly. You know? So. And it just was an amazing season. And it was different. You know, they came back with a very mature, uh, older, wiser, yeah. uh, sadder in some ways, well, Jack. I like to say that this season, the season five of Samurai Jack, is kind of what the show would have been had it run for 14 years. <laughs> it you know, there. Yeah. everybody would have grown, you know, the audience would have grown, mm -hmm. and we would have come to a natural conclusion. Right. You know, of course, probably had it been for 14 years, seasons 12 and 13 would have been real bummers. <laughs> it's true, right? Oh, he lost his sword in season 11, and now we've just been watching him suffer. <laughs> Mope. You know? Until he gets that motorcycle, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How was it coming back oh, to yeah. the character? Spoilers. Yeah, it, yeah, forget it, guys. You need to catch up. It's, That's it's my thing. It's like, if, you, if you were still complaining about spoilers, you didn't care that much. No, you need it, you, you need haven't seen it yet. It. Yeah. Be there. Um, what was it like coming back to the character in that different space? Because he was uh, a lot more introspective. Um, he had a romance for the first yes. time, which is spoiler, but again, get up, guys. Uh, um, and it, what was it like being able to play different facets that they had never given him to you before? Again, it was, it felt natural. I mean, it was a huge challenge, um, but 
I mean, especially because it was this same wonderful person mm -hmm. that we'd all come to know and love for over the years, but he was in a very, very different place. He was so, so much more damaged, you know? And for me, the challenge was to play, you know, these circumstances, you know, the, this loss, this like 50 years. I mean, you know, you hear those stories of Japanese soldiers lost in the jungle, don't know the war is over yet. Like that for 50 years. Totally. But he knows he's, the war is over and he's lost, you know, just, but also hold on to what made the character special. So hold on to a little bit of that light in all the darkness, yes. you know? Um, and especially in the scenes where he starts talking to himself. himself. Yeah. And I tried to create a kind of old Jack mm -hmm. who is very much dark and in a place that he does not feel complete. He does not feel whole. And also have some of the you know, the idea of Jack in his head, the younger Jack, who yeah. is a little bit lighter in some ways, but who uh, progressively gets angrier, angrier at and, him. and darker in his own way. Yeah. But it's a young, energetic darkness. What do you mean? Give us the sword, it's ours. Uh, yeah. you know? So amazing. So it's the same guy, but different parts of his head. So it, it was yeah. exceptional. And you really felt like you got, um, inside that character in a way yeah. that we'd never gotten before. No, well, that's the thing. There was no interior mm -hmm. of the character in the entire first four seasons. Yes, exactly. You know, it was all things that were happening to him and things he was doing. You never really knew what was happening inside. Yes. And it was interesting because that I got just from the direction. You know, whenever there'd be a fight or an action or he'd fall, I was want to go, ah! Like, and to go, no, less. Uh. It doesn't hurt him that much. He doesn't feel it that much. Oh, wow. Great you know? note. Yeah. So we, immediately you can But, dial but this back. time, you know, after 50 years, he was feeling, feeling it. Feeling it. Yeah. Really. All right. So I have to ask, angst beard or traditional looking Jack? We don't <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe it's because I got too much Indian blood in me, but I'm anti-beard. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for that, for that the hipster trend to just go. You want, you're Let's go back to shaving. the 50s. <laughs> and how did you feel about the ending of it? You know, uh, fandom, some were on board, some were sad, um, some wanted more from it. I mean, I think if right. we ever had time to come back to it again, <laughs> I, all of us would want that. But just for, as an artist, looking at the, co the completion of a project you'd done for a long time, how'd you feel? I mean, as the person playing Jack, mm -hmm. you know, it was, I mean, I was sad. Yeah. You know, and Gendy said that before, before we ever saw the bat last script, it's like, it's like, do you know how it ends? Like, oh yeah, it's gonna make you cry. And it did. It did, yeah. But from an artistic standpoint and from a viewing standpoint, I felt complete. Yeah. I mean, because the entire story has been about sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Here's a man who sacrificed his childhood, you know, who sacrificed his memories. And every time, you know, in the future, when he had a chance to go back, he always sacrificed it for someone else's sake. Someone else's sake, exactly. And finally, the only way he was able to complete the mission that he was raised for was through Ashi's sacrifice. Oh. And to me, that's just, that completes the circle. It's all about sacrifice. Yeah. That's it. It, it. I think he totally landed the theme beautifully, uh, even though he ripped our hearts out I know. <laughs> and threw it at us. I know. <laughs> um, so I also had the the great honor last year of getting to listen to you do a live table read of the Futurama episode. Oh! I was in the audience having the greatest <laughs> time of my life um, last year for uh, Futurama: World of Tomorrow, which is the uh, iPad game that you can play. Yeah. Uh, they all got together, the whole cast, uh, except for Katie, and um, you oh, guys was... were able to do uh, one of the classic episodes. And yeah. watching them together, that cast. We did was, Proposition Infinity, it was Proposition right? Proposition Infinity. Which is one of my favorite was episodes. Absolutely. This robosexuality <laughs> has to stop. <laughs> was, uh, and until it does, we're going to zoom in real close on it. So, what was it? You know, you guys have also had that experience through 
the, the on and off life <laughs> of Futurama to be able to get back together again. But I know. in those instances, um, how, is it really special to be able to just sit there and be able to have fun with them and yeah, get that energy back together? It's, I mean, because it's such a great group of people mm -hmm. and just a great group of creators. So anytime we get a chance to do it, you know, although we've had what uh, our executive producer, David X. Cohen, has called our welcome to the fourth last episode ever <laughs> of Futurama. We've had a lot of last episodes a lot ever. Of last episodes. Um, but then again, that means we've also had to come back from the dead yes. a bunch of times. And every time we get to come back, it's always a joy. I always feel so grateful when you guys had those movies right. and then you guys actually came back. For, uh, although, it, being on Futurama, has given me some insight into people's reactions to zombies. Because at this point, <laughs> uh, what I find is like, you know, after the first time we got canceled, people were like, oh no, 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 no. And the second time, oh no, we need more Futurama. Now, fans kind of don't give a shit, you know? <laughs> they're just like, really? Uh, I mean, they're less, like, this time? you guys probably gonna come back again, right? <laughs> and I'm, you know, like, when I, now when I watch a zombie thing, I'm like, People aren't going to be that invested. Once people start dying and coming back from the dead, people get used to that real quick. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, there's grandma again. Somebody give me an ax. Yeah, you pulled the, the emotion card one too many times on that one. But I will say, please come back at any kind of time. Or How was it? Did well, we get did get to do one, uh, one new episode. Yeah, you remember? the exactly. um, For uh, Chris Hardwick's Nerdist podcast, yep. that we did Radiorama. Right. The first unanimated episode of Futurama. And it was awesome. It's it was so, great. It's, it was like getting another little magic night of you guys doing that all over again. Well, anytime we get to line up for work, you know, pay cuts for everyone. <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to talk also uh, about, you know, you have. She has nothing on these cards except dirty pictures. They're just, they're She's just, just pretending. He's going to take, he's going to sign them later. Um, uh, <laughs> I wanted to know... Hentai? What does that even mean? Uh, yeah. We'll talk about it later. That's sci-fi live streaming after dark. Come back later, guys. Um, so, you have done so many great animated shows. You've done game, video games. What do you consider yourself? Because you're a geek. You come right. to these as pure yes. because of the things that you love, too. Mm -hmm. When you identify yourself and your fandom, are you a gamer? Are you a geek? Or what, what's your thing? I'm a comic book geek. Yeah, that's your. Yeah, I mean that's where I started, and that's I think where my geek goes deepest. Yeah. You know, I mean, unfortunately, the problem with keeping up with games is when you started way back, it was like 2D, 8-bit, you know. <laughs> the technology outpaces you at a certain point. Uh, like, oh, wow, those 360 degree cameras are making me a little nauseous, you know? It's true. But comic books are still comic books. They're still comic books, exactly. Although, I don't know, that comicsology is a little weird. It's telling me which panel to look at. I don't like being told where to look. <laughs> don't tell me how to read. <laughs> right. Guided view you. <laughs> um, but no, that's, and honestly, that's part of the reason I come to the cons, is to meet, you know, my comic book heroes, yeah. you know, the people who made them. I, I got to meet, uh, remember, we were, we were at a con, where was it? I think in Canada. And I got to meet Neil Adams. <gasps> you did? And I was like, okay, I need an in. I need an in. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Adams, uh, my name is Phil Lamar. I'm actually a, a voice actor, and I voiced the character that you helped create, John Stewart. He's like, right. oh, yeah. And then he proceeded to tell me stories about... <laughs> you know, the hurdles he had to go through to try oh. to get a black character into a mainstream comic book back in the 70s. Yeah. You know, it was like, wow, wait, what? They didn't want them to be brown? You know, like, he actually had to fight to get the right color brown. Oh, my gosh. But what a great, uh, you being able to have that and talk with him. Right? And be able to have that moment, which is so oh wonderful. Oh, God, yeah. So... Are you a long box kind of keeper? Do you have your collection of things that you have in your garage, or, or are you more read and then move on? I've always considered myself more of a reader mm -hmm. than a collector. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not trying to keep everything pristine, although I do have a box called Great Comics ah. that I keep all of the things that are just amazing, like my original um, 
editions of Dark Knight. Oh, nice. You know, uh, my new Teen Titans number one. Oh, cool. You know, all the, all the, all the really, really great stuff. New and old. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, the worst is when you can't find something. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, like my, where is my Muhammad Ali versus Superman? I know I have it. <laughs> you start digging. Right. Where did I put it? That's when we need to alphabetize and we need to A, we uh, That's That's what I wish ourselves. I was more of a collector. <laughs> Um, so let's also, you know, you have worked on so many people's shows, brought their characters to life, yeah. but there's something really special that you're getting a chance to do now yeah. um, because you're producing a show called Goblins Animated, which is based on a comic book, right. um, and that's by uh, Terrell Hunt. Yep. So, you know, because you are, you know the world, you, you get a chance to read the books, you yeah. get to see what's out there that's just... In, you're enjoying as a fan. You're right. How did that book come across your desk? And then tell me a little bit about the process of going, no, you know, I want to be behind actually turning this into another medium. Well, um, my, my partner and friend Matt King um, ha had been reading the Goblins webcomic um, before I was, and he hit me to it. And then, you know, I met Terrell through him. And Terrell is here somewhere. I don't know. If, I'm sure they're over on the other side. Okay. Um, but... I started reading the webcomic, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, you know, back in the day, I was a D and D player. You know, back. Me I, too. I still have my red box and my blue right? box. Right. Like my mom. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, I remember when the the first hardback Dungeon Master's Guide came out. It's like, oh my God, it's almost twenty dollars. <laughs> yes. Um, and so it was amazing to be able to go back into that world but through this new... For anybody who doesn't know, the premise of uh, Goblins is goblins, you know, the low-level characters that, you know, as an adventurer, you just sort of cut their heads off so you can get some experience and move on. Mm -hmm. They become the heroes of our story. Like a bunch, a group of goblins are tired of getting their asses kicked, and they say, well, why don't we become an adventuring party and, you know, get some experience and go up levels and be able to protect our village? And that's what it is. <laughs> Terrell once described it as Smurfs meets Game of Thrones. Oh my God, I love that. That's the best log line ever. You know, and it's great because it's partially just sort of, you know, D&D &D geek inside baseball. You know, like one of the first uh, fight scenes starts with the goblin up on the thing. It's like, I'm your worst nightmare. A goblin with a plus one sword and an elevation bonus. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> you know, it's like, I don't, can you put that on a cartoon? It's like, well, we're going to. We're going to, good. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, he crafted such th an amazingly deep world that has, like, inside jokes like that, plus some really amazing heartfelt stuff, mm. you know, going on. And we're like, this needs to be brought to life on a broader plane. Mm -hmm. And so we decided we got to do this. And because it is so unique and so deeply geeky, we felt like we can't just, like, write this down and show some executive the comic and say, get it? They're like, no, we don't get it. Is it like Smurfs? No, no, Smurfs means going through. It's like, so it's a kid's show. Like, no. <laughs> right, so, I can imagine those meetings right. being miserable. <laughs> so we decided we need to be able to show them yeah. this world, these characters. And we did a, a crowdfunding campaign um, late last year and we raised, uh, we funded our money to do uh, a five minute mega trailer to really be able to bring it visually and actively to life and be able to use some of like the most amazing voice people in the world. We've got um, Billy West and Maurice LaMarche, yes. um, Tara Strong, Jennifer Hale, um, Matthew Mercer. Um, you run in some good circles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, and it was like, and it's funny because none of them knew the project, so I was calling in every imaginable favor, and um, we're really, really excited to finally be able to get started once we get all of the uh, t-shirts made and, and start you know, fulfilling, all, yes, right? all the fulfillment done. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've, we've, we've already begun, and we're working with um, a group called Surfer Jack, which is a production company run by uh, Jeff Swampy Marsh, one of the co-creators oh. of Phineas and Ferb. And they're working with us to help, uh, you know, do the storyboarding and bring it all to life. So, you know, when you put together, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a sizzle reel like that yeah. to get people excited, um, you know, 
the process then in making the show sometimes has a different look. It has um, some different ideas on who else you'll be able to add for voice cast, who can at the time help out with uh, a sizzle reel but may not right. be able to commit to a longer project. So from the producerial side of it, what are, what are some of the things that you're learning at this process that you're enjoying, that you're kind of getting um, a new look at because you're in a different stage of the development of an idea like this? Yeah, well, I mean, the best part of it is being able to dig down. I mean, because I've been in animation for going on 30 years now, yeah. and I still don't know how it works until now. <laughs> until now, like, now oh, you're... You mean somebody actually draws each one? That's crazy. And the turnaround time and figuring out how oh long that's going to take. And... That's the thing. I mean, in the time that I've been in show business, the movie business has changed. Like, to the, you know, it's like, well, you need $80,000 to make a five-minute short on Super 8 to... Hey, I just shot a movie on my phone. It's in my back pocket. Want to see it? It's you know. crazy, right? But animation? Still. Still takes forever. Yep. And still needs hundreds of people, and they still have to be amazingly talented for it to be any good. It's, it's true. You, you got to find that team. You got to find the company. Are you going to do it domestically? You're going to do it overseas? Right. All of those kinds of things. Although from a producer standpoint, the weirdest thing is you go to animation people and say, okay, how much would it cost to do this? Like, well, how much you got? Like, <laughs> no, no, how much would it cost? Depends. Do you, want, do you want all the heads? I'm like, well, yes. Because <laughs> well, we can cut some of them out, and that'll save you some money. Exactly. Background players. Maybe no one needs to talk in this scene, right? right? <laughs> can they just all go like this? But, I mean, the biggest challenge has been fighting, the producer fighting with the fan. It's like, I love the comic. I want everything in it. It's like, can't afford it. Can't afford it. It's like, well, you have to. So we're fighting to see what we can capture. And to me, that's... The, you know, as a fan, watching things be pulled from comics into movies and TV shows, I've learned that you don't, you can't be slavishly devoted to the source material, Sin City. Mm -hmm. You know, because no matter how cinematic a comic book is, it's still a comic it's, book. Exactly, it's a different And if medium. you're going to make it into a movie or a TV show, you have to translate it. I remember when uh, we did the first season of Samurai Jack, um, Brett Ratner yeah. actually bought the rights to a live action oh boy. Samurai Jack. And I was like, what, you, what? Part of what makes it so cool is all the amazing animation stuff. Yeah. You know, the 2D-ness of it, the like, shh, shh, shh. If you take all that away, you're just gonna have some guy doing a you know, bad version of a Hong Kong action movie. Exactly. You know, you have to hold on to what the, the essence yeah. of it that drew you to this project and then figure out a way to translate it into the new medium. And that's what we're doing. And that's really exciting because you yeah. get to fight for it. You get to fight for the things that you believe in that are passionate, you know. Yeah. And, and so for you guys, what's, is it going to be 22 minute episodes? Is it going to be shorter? What are you guys finding the sweet spot to be able to tell the story, to be able to afford and all the things, you know, that are partially commerce, but then also the creative? Well, I mean, Right now, we're just working on the trailer, and unfortunately, decisions like that are gonna have to be left to, like, when we get to a platform. Yeah. You know, because we can say, we want it to make, yeah. we want them to be 49-minute episodes. <laughs> but if nobody has a place to air 49-minute episodes, right. then we're gonna have to change our, you know, our tune. Um, but we are in such a wonderful space for animation now, where adults yeah. are really, they, you know, you've Rick and Morty, Samurai coming right. back, uh, you know, Adult Swim being able to provide for years a totally different look. BoJack Horseman, which you voiced yeah. for too. You've got uh, streaming places, you've got traditional places that have been homes for this, um, mm. and you've got the audience that are showing up for it. So yes. that must be really, really heartening to know that one, you got it funded, and yeah. then two, you know that there's people out there that really love this medium and they're going to be a place for it. Right, and those two things are completely tied together. I mean, the only reason we were able to fund it is because of the support of all of the fans of, you know, Goblins, the original comic, and, you know, of the people that we had working on this. And the fact that so many people were so willing to literally invest in our dream and our vision just makes you feel so, so warm. Mm. But it also means you have a great responsibility. You do. Because you have to deliver for those people. So we're up to it, I hope. So what's the next stage for us to tease just in terms of when you hope that we'll be able to see something else, what you're going to be doing behind the scenes to be selling it? Like, wh how, how big does this year look for you? Or is this really a, a year of development and moving forward with look and design and those kinds of things? 
Um, yeah, this, I mean, we're hoping to, I think the next thing we'll do, besides getting all of the, you know, merchandise right. out, is start being able to create the new versions, the animated versions of these characters. So hopefully, you know, we can, you know, put our, uh, our backers, you know, because actually the Indiegogo campaign is still up and running because we did so well. Indiegogo put us into what they call in demand. Oh, nice. So, which is great because there are all of these added costs that you didn't know. It's like, oh, wait, we have to pay for that too. Yeah. Animation never is cheaper than you think it's going to exactly. be. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, we're hopefully going to be able to provide our backers with you know, the new character designs of all Good. of these, you know, the, the, these great characters. And, you know, I'm going to be. Um, doing part one of the perks that we gave away was VO workshops, Ooh. you know, that I'm going to be yeah. doing for some the people who were able to, who donated at that level. And I think hopefully we'll be able to live stream some of that or just have some, you know, some screen caps. And, um, and as we go along, we'll obviously be keeping all the backers, you know, updated on everything that's, that's happening. And as we build it, we will show it to you. Oh, that's super exciting. I yeah. can't wait to see that. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask, because that actually does flow into, I'm sure, at, at these kinds of events, people asking questions at panels and such, and just mm. people coming up to you, they ask, you know, hey, I, I really would like to go into voice acting. Mm. Um, what do I do for that? What's the thing to do? And you've done it, and it's 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 a journeyman actor kind of thing. It's yeah. gig to gig. It's mm. knowing people. It's people falling in love with what you did with one character and hoping you can do it for another kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's hard. So, so for you as somebody that is that can tell somebody, hey, you know, this is a path to take, what are some of the, the, the smartest things that you think people can do that are thinking right. about possibly taking a path like you've taken? Well, the trickiest thing about voiceover in particular is everybody I know who does it came at it from a different angle. You know, there are people who were improvisers, there are people who were singers, engineers, yeah. you know, radio personalities, like everybody, you know, I know came at it differently. So it's always hard to tell somebody like, okay, how would I get into it? I'm like, I don't know you, no. where you, what do you do? What, you know, yes. and it is actually a much longer conversation than I usually have time, but totally. there are some, you know, fundamental, you know, things you need to know. One, it's acting. You know, it's not a career that you can pick like, well, I kind of want to be an actor, but that seems too hard. I just want to be a voice actor instead. It's like, no, nope. same thing. It's actually in some ways harder because voice acting for animation is a scale job. Like no matter how long you've been doing it, when you start a new show, you get paid the base rate. Yeah. You know, um, like, what was it? Frank Welker, who was doing the voice of... Um, Everybody. You know, well, Shag, I mean, um, no, Fred, Fred. Freddy, since 1969. You know, when he and I started a show, uh, we did the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, um, or actually, we did Evil Can Carney. It was Grim and Evil at first. Frank got paid the same I got paid. He'd been doing it for 25 years at that point, longer than I had. Amazing. And we got paid the same. So don't expect <laughs> yeah, to get don't, rich. Don't get in VO to get rich. <laughs> well, Although if you're as good as Frank, you might. You might. You might. Well, and also if you're as great as you. And unfortunately, our time just blew by, which was uh, oh, there we go. It was amazing uh, to be able to talk with you. I'm so thank excited you. about the new project. And yeah, me too. Thank you for all of the wonderful characters you've brought into this <laughs> world. So thank you for taking time with us today. Oh, no, thank you, Tara. And for everybody out here, thank you so much for being here. Um, and just so you know, coming up in a few minutes, we have comics legend Chris. Claremont, yes? Nice! Hey, Chris Claremont, but so please I'm going to have to stick around for that. For that conversation. In the meantime, you can join the conversation as always on Twitter. Hashtag, it's a fan thing. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>